Tonight, Hurricane Fiona tearing through the Caribbean as a powerful Category 3 storm. Turks and Caicos battered with torrential rains and winds up to 115 miles an hour. The storm also leaving a deadly path of destruction in the Dominican Republic. And in Puerto Rico, widespread devastation on the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Maria. Right now, 80% of the island still without power. Gabe Gutierrez is there as residents line up for gas, plus the storm's latest track. Also, the lawsuit just filed against Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. The migrants flown to Martha's Vineyard, now accusing him of carrying out an illegal scheme for political gain. The Texas sheriff also launching a criminal investigation against DeSantis, saying those 48 migrants were lured by fake promises of work and shelter. Bail reform uproar. The man behind an axe-wielding rampage at a New York City McDonald's released without bail. That move even sparking reaction from the state's governor. And special master hearing, the senior judge, the same one recommended by former President Trump, now grilling his defense team over documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. Why he told them, quote, you can't have your cake and eat it. Plus, a Louisiana college student found shot to death inside of her car. The search tonight for her killer. And Justice Served, the popular serial podcast releasing its first episode in years following the release of Adnan Syed. But not everybody is celebrating his new freedom. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. I'm Sam Brock in for Tom Yamas. Tonight, Fiona unleashing a fury of rain and wind after strengthening to the season's first major hurricane. At this hour, residents along the coast of Turks and Caicos urged to seek higher ground as a potentially dangerous storm surge threatens the islands. And in Puerto Rico, deadly destruction. Fiona triggering mudslides and wiping out roads. Gas lines there now stretching for miles. This is most residents are still without power or water. And this eerily familiar scene playing out on the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Maria, which Puerto Rico has yet to fully recover from. Fiona is expected to strengthen again now as it takes aim at Bermuda. We'll have more on that in just a few minutes. But we begin tonight with Gabe Gutierrez in the middle of disaster in Puerto Rico. Tonight, Hurricane Fiona is lashing Turks and Caicos after intensifying to a Category 3 storm leaving a trail of destruction across the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Cars flipped downstream, roads washed away. It's now the first major Atlantic hurricane of the season. This morning, in the southern coastal town of Salinas, we met this family returning to their flooded home for the first time. I don't know how to explain, yeah. Um, it's so bad. Like, all this stuff around, I don't know. 80% of Puerto Rico is still without power, 55% is without water, and nearly 100 emergency shelters are open across the island. Around the Caribbean, at least four deaths are being blamed on the storm or its aftermath. Puerto Rico's governor is asking the Biden administration for expedited federal help. Today, the line for fuel in Puerto Rico grew longer and longer, especially in the southern parts of the island. They need it not just for their cars, but for their portable generators. Some of these drivers told us they waited here for more than two hours. What I am going to do if I don't get this gas? On this day, marking exactly five years since Hurricane Maria tore through the island, we toured the latest devastation from Fiona by air. The water here just kept rising, choking off these communities for the better part of two days. Thankfully, today with the sun out for the first time, more of the floodwaters are now receding, but they devastated countless lives across Puerto Rico. This storm was different than Maria. Many parts of Puerto Rico had seen harsher winds before, but not this much rain. Carlos Benitez raced relief supplies to hard hit areas after Maria. Fiona's aftermath now hitting hard. Devastating, you know, the PTSD just come back right away when you, as soon as I, I flew the helicopter at 8 in the morning on Monday, um, it just, my heart breaks again, you know, it's like coming back on a movie and seeing Maria, all the destruction, all the floating, all the people waving on, on the top of the roof um, requesting for help, it's, it's heartbreaking. Unbelievable. Gabe Gutierrez joining us now from Toa Baja, Puerto Rico. Gabe, you mentioned FEMA has boosted its presence there with more than half the island with no access to water right now, as you reported. Has the agency been able to help in that regard? Well, uh, Sam, you may remember that during Hurricane Maria, FEMA had major problems pre-positioning 
its warehouses. Now FEMA says that its warehouses are fully stocked here in Puerto Rico, and they have been able to distribute some aid so far. We expect more workers to show up here uh, in the coming days. And despite the widespread flood damage, you see, people here in this neighborhood in Toa Baja have been cleaning up their homes throughout the day. Despite that flood damage, the biggest concern, as we, we reported, is this issue that more than half of this island right now still does not have access to drinking water, Sam. Life-threatening, no question about it. And Gabe, you know, there's a cruel coincidence here that you were in Puerto Rico five years ago reporting on Hurricane Maria's devastating impact and staying with that story in the months that followed. Do you get the impression there in Puerto Rico that they were more prepared this time? Are you seeing any difference on the ground? Uh, well, yes and no. Well, during Hurricane Maria five years ago, there was even more desperation, I think, in the days immediately following the storm for one main reason, and that was the communication lines were down extensively. In this storm, we do have better cell phone service, and that can't be overstated. Communications is key following a disaster. But here we are again, Sam, five years later, and so many residents here are frustrated that the power grid here in Puerto Rico wasn't more effectively rebuilt after Hurricane Maria. It's several days after the storm, and four out of five people right now in Puerto Rico still do not have power. In this neighborhood, you can see behind me, the only lights here are the ones behind our cameras. This entire neighborhood is in the dark, save for a few lights in the distance from people with portable generators. But as you saw in my report, there's a run on gas. That is very similar to what we saw during Hurricane Maria. Perhaps the one good sign that I saw during my aerial tour today is that those floodwaters are receding. The governor told me yesterday that he hopes that that means soon more power will be restored and then we might see this water system back up, hopefully in the next few days, not in the next few months like it was after Hurricane Maria, Sam. Gabe Gutierrez on the ground for us in Puerto Rico tonight. Thank you, Gabe, and stay safe. In the meantime, Hurricane Fiona not slowing down or showing any signs of it as it takes aim at Bermuda. That storm continuing to strengthen. Joining us now in studio is NBC meteorologist Dylan Dreyer. Dylan, the key question now, what's the track for the storm? Well, the track is going to take it very close to Bermuda, but far enough to the west where it shouldn't be much of an impact, which is a good thing because it is a major hurricane right now, a Category 3, north of Turks and Caicos Islands with 115 mile per hour winds. And you can see just how expansive this storm is. It's likely to strengthen into a Category 4 hurricane as it passes, I'd say more than 100 miles west of Bermuda. That's why it won't be as much of a threat, but the th real threat kicks in for eastern Canada as we go into Friday night and Saturday. It'll weaken from a Category 3 to an extra tropical low, but destructive winds are still likely with this storm, and it has all that moisture with it, so torrential rain will likely uh, cause some concerns up that way as well. For the east coast, again, the storm kind of goes right in between us and Bermuda, but it does still look like the rip currents will be very dangerous up and down the east coast, really from New England all the way down to Florida, so something to keep in mind as we go into the upcoming weekend. The tropics are getting more and more active. We also have Tropical Storm Gaston, although that will stay over the water and not be much of an issue. But the next one we're keeping an eye on, 80% chance of formation over the next five days. So as this moves into warmer waters, there is a chance this could strengthen into our next name, Tropical Storm, this time around south of Puerto Rico, south of the Dominican. But it does have this development zone, which will steer it perhaps into the Gulf of Mexico. If we look at all the different uh, computer models, this is indicating that it looks like it should take that turn to the north. So that is where we have to watch it closely because the waters are very warm in the Gulf of Mexico and we'll have to see what happens if it does kind of maneuver between Mexico and Cuba there. So that will be the next storm we're watching. But in the meantime, it is Fiona as it gets closer to Bermuda and then eventually up into Canada. Sam. All right, some nerve wracking days ahead. Dylan, thank you very much. Now to that escalating immigration debate. A Texas sheriff opening a criminal investigation into Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and his decision to fly 50 migrants to Martha's Vineyard. Some of those migrants tonight filing a class action lawsuit against Florida officials and DeSantis himself accusing them of fraud. NBC's Emily Aketa has the very latest. Tonight, the battle over the border is building, with a new criminal investigation examining the flights that carried 48 migrants to Martha's Vineyard last week. The controversial move arranged by Florida's Republican governor, Ron DeSantis. 
A Texas sheriff, Javier Salazar, a Democrat, says the migrants were lured in with false promises of work and assistance. Our understanding is that a Venezuelan migrant uh, was paid a, a, what we would call a bird dog fee to recruit approximately 50 migrants. Some of the migrants now suing Florida officials. None of them knew that they were going to be uh, dropped off uh, unceremoniously in Martha's Vineyard. They were provided um, an ability to be in the, the most posh sanctuary jurisdiction. DeSantis insists the migrants knew where the flights were going and signed consent forms and that it puts the spotlight on President Biden's border policies, which Republicans blame for the record migrant surge. If 50 was a burden on one of the richest places in our country, what about all these other communities that have been overrun with hundreds or thousands? The Department of Homeland Security now confirming there have been more than 2 million illegal border crossings in just the last 11 months, smashing all previous records. While tonight, President Biden responding to unconfirmed rumors DeSantis may send a migrant flight to his home state. He should come visit. We have a beautiful shoreline. Though Governor DeSantis today would not confirm another planned flight. Sam? All right, Emily, thank you so much. And knowing that the Florida State Legislature has appropriated some $12 million from the moving of migrants, this might not be the end of the story. To look at the situation and the politics behind it, let's bring in NBC News senior national political reporter Mark Caputo. Mark, Governor DeSantis, we know, has carved out a central role for himself in this issue. He kind of aggressively asserted himself in the middle of the situation, certainly since the migrants were coming from Texas initially, likely with his national brand in mind. So is this going to help or hurt him politically, especially with some of those voters in South Florida who fled from crisis themselves? I'd like to see some polling on it. While on one hand, yes, there's a tradition in Miami-Dade County, where I am, in South Florida, of wel welcoming migrants. There's also a tradition of various immigrant communities saying, hey, we have ours. Uh, we want to close the border door behind us. So you saw that in 1980 with elements of the Cuban community and the Mariel Boatlift. You might see that again here. Uh, there is a difference here. Obviously, as you said, the migrants in question were taken from San Antonio, Texas, uh, for some reason, which is probably too complicated to get into right now, and kind of flown indirectly and ultimately to Martha's Vineyard. Taking, Mark, a wider lens on this, we know that earlier in the summer, that Roe v. Wade proved to be a galvanizing issue for Democrats. So is it possible that border security now is serving as a Republican political counter to bring out the base to the polls in November? If you look at the polling, the top two issues, an NBC poll from the weekend, showed that the top two issues are the economy and immigration. And on both of those, Republicans nationwide are favored more than Democrats. Abortion is an issue where Democrats are favored more than Republicans. So what DeSantis has really done here, and very effectively, call it a stunt, call it a ploy, call it a trick, call it whatever you want. The reality is, is DeSantis in one week has totally changed the dialogue in politics to talk solely about immigration, what he did, and now he's trying to really shift the, the focus to the border, the amount of people coming across, and what Biden's policies are and what they're not. And in doing so, the, I was going to call him President DeSantis, Governor DeSantis wants to really cast a spotlight on President Biden and what he's done. Now, whether that's going to be effective or not, who knows? Because one of the things that Governor DeSantis is doing is he's positioning himself to run for president in 2024, especially if former President Trump doesn't. And right now, DeSantis is looking at President Biden as his main opponent, not Charlie Crist, the Democratic nominee for governor. So not even discussing the humanity or lack thereof involved. DeSantis clearly sees this as a winning issue. What should Democrats be doing to make busing migrants and the harm done a strong issue for them? Well, I don't want to give any side, Democrat or Republicans, advice on what they should or shouldn't do. But what Democrats are doing is they're doing a broad-based legal assault as well as public relations one. You're hearing a number of Democrats say, look, this is human, human trafficking. You're seeing the sheriff of Bear County in San Antonio, Texas, open investigation. You're seeing the lawyers for the migrants, some of the migrants, most of the migrants, flown to Martha's Vineyard, have asked for a state investigation in Massachusetts and a federal investigation from DOJ. They're also considering suing. I think all of those things together cast a negative spotlight, or they hope, on Governor DeSantis. Whether it works or not, well, we're going to find out on November 8th.
All right, Mark Caputo, thank you very much. Next to outrage in New York after a man who was caught on camera wielding a hatchet. Yes, a hatchet was released without bail. That video now going viral and gaining the attention of the state's governor. NBC Stephen Romo has all the details for us. Tonight, terrifying video going viral. It shows a man wielding a hatchet and confronting customers at a downtown Manhattan McDonald's. The situation escalating after a fight Friday night. The video starts in the middle of that fight between four men. 31-year-old Michael Palacios appears to throw a punch and then getting punched dozens of times by three guys. Before Palacios reaches into his backpack and pulls out that axe. Oh. He then smashes a nearby table and shatters a glass divider before confronting his attackers around the restaurant. Appearing to hit one in the head while wielding that hatchet in his other hand. Even getting in the face of a woman visibly shaken as he smashes the table she's sitting at and continues to yell. After two minutes, Palacios grabs a bike and exits the fast food chain, saying, <laughs> According to police, victims did not report any injuries. Palacios was later found by officers and arrested on charges of criminal mischief, three counts of menacing, and two counts of criminal possession of a weapon. But he was soon released without needing to post bail because the offenses are misdemeanors covered by New York's 2019 bail reform law. Governor Kathy Hochul even addressing the incident, seeming to call out the D.A. inquiring why Palacios was eligible for release. They have the discretion to uh, charge uh, in a different way that would make them bail eligible. And certainly the way it was charged now had nothing to do with bail because they would have been treated the exact same way before any bail laws were made years and years ago. The Manhattan DA's office did not return our request for comment, but it's not the first time the governor has been at odds with the DA. Just last month, after a man was caught on camera appearing to sucker punch someone else on the street, he was released without bail on supervised release. She says she stepped in to have him arrested since he was a repeat offender on parole for life. That was a horrific situation on all fronts. Advocates of the laws argue the vast majority of those released do not commit violent crimes while they await trial, 99 percent, according to data from the city comptroller. But New Yorkers dealing with increasing violent crime have questions of their own. The acts in a bag, yes, that is, you know, it's a bit extreme, but we see such things happen in New York City daily. Peter Carey started safe walks about a year and a half ago as crime started rising in the city. It's a repeated cycle where organizations like ourselves are bearing, you know, the weight and the responsibility of putting in the hard work to help within the public safety space while the city leadership is failing. NBC's efforts to reach Palacios or his attorney were unsuccessful, but he did do an interview with ABC7 Eyewitness News. The most important thing is don't be afraid to defend yourself. Where he says his actions were in self-defense. My intention is not to put anyone in a hospital or dice anybody up. The reason why I pulled out the hatchet was because, okay, I'm going to get back at these guys, but I'm going to make sure that they don't jump me again. All right, Stephen Romo joining us on set now to talk about this. It's not, Stephen, just that this man was wielding a hatchet. We saw him smash glass. We saw him smack someone in the head. He's out on the streets right now, but he was charged. So what do we know about the next steps? Yeah, they did let him go without bail, and he does have to show back up in court a month from today, actually. That's his next court date. He is still facing those charges for those misdemeanors. We know he's being represented by an attorney with the Legal Aid Society. So this is there's more to come on this story. But the bigger, broader topic of bail reform, that is not likely to die down anytime soon, Sam. But for the next month. He's out on the streets. Same as I get. All right, Steve Romo, thank you so much. Moving now to the very latest on the battle over the documents seized at former President Trump's Florida home. Lawyers for the Justice Department and Donald Trump held their first meeting today with the special master appointed to review them. Now, the special master, Judge Raymond Deary, recommended by Trump's own lawyers, urging the legal team to provide more information regarding the classification of the documents found, or they could have problems. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us right now from the White House. Peter, the federal judge tasked with being the special master here, this third-party legal expert reviewing the materials seized by the FBI from Mar-a-Lago, did not mince words when it came to the former president's attorneys today, right? What did he say? 
Yes, yeah, Sam, you're right. So during today's hearing, again, the first, the special master, that federal judge appointed to sift through those documents seized by the FBI from mar lago last month, uh, he really appeared skeptical about Mr. Trump's claim that he had declassified them. The judge saying, unless Mr. Trump's lawyers can show that those 100 sensitive documents are not classified, that he will treat them like they are. He told the Trump team today, quote, you can't have your cake and eat it. The special master that Mr. Trump's lawyers, as you noted, did handpick today indicated his review may take just four weeks. That's also notable because it would be even quicker than federal prosecutors, Sam, had been hoping for. Got it. So we could be looking at an expedited timeline. And Peter, it's our understanding the Trump team also filed another request with the court today. What do you know about that? Yeah, so that's a separate legal fight, right? That's where Mr. Trump's lawyers are trying to block the government's request to stay the court's ordering that the Justice Department halt its criminal investigation into those recovered documents. Mr. Trump's lawyers called the investigation both unprecedented and misguided, and they said, quote, it is a document storage dispute that has spiraled out of control. This, again, the beginning of a process that we think is going to take a little bit more time as it draws out. Sam. Thank you, Peter. A nation's eyes on that situation. And certainly a nation also watching the economy right now. All eyes on the Federal Reserve, which is expected to announce yet another substantial interest rate hike tomorrow. The agency right now is trying to walk a tightrope, trying to curb inflation while also avoiding a full-blown recession. Stocks tumbling ahead of that announcement. The Dow, the S&P 500, and NASDAQ all shedding roughly a percentage point today. Joining me now for more on this is Austin Goolsby. He's a former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under former President Barack Obama. Austin, thanks so much for being with us. You know, all indications right now are pointing to yet another three-quarter percent rate hike, the same that we've seen now for the last couple of months. But what a lot of people are really going to be looking closely at is the quarterly outlook due out tomorrow as well. What are you watching closely? Yeah, look, a quarter point interest rate rise at the least there are some people think who think that the fed might raise rates a full percentage point i think that the fed is scared they've had inflation and certainly the last inflation number that we got the so-called core inflation was higher than what they wanted and so now they're going to raise rates willy-nilly uh to try to get that under control if they do that, we will certainly have a recession. I mean, the most common cause of recessions in U.S. economic history since we've been keeping the data is the Fed raising interest rates faster than the economy can handle. And that's why you see the stock market reacting the way it is. And that's why you've got people very concerned. I still think if we could get some improvements on the supply side and, and improvements on these supply shocks, we could get more months like the month before last month <laughs> where inflation came down and that would take some of the pressure off. But without taking that pressure off, I think the Fed is is going to go to town. Yeah, I want to zero in on that point, Austin, because after some signs of optimism here, then there was that disappointing inflation report in August that saw the consumer price index rise as many economists had expected it to drop. So the question there's asking, is the Fed's approach working here? Is it too soon to tell? It's too soon to tell. I mean, the thing to remember about the Fed is Fed actions take months to wear, work their way through the economy. So that's why a lot of economists, when they see the Fed raising 75 basis points, as they call it, three quarters of a percent every meeting, where in normal times when they're raising it be a quarter of a point per meeting, we still have yet to feel the shoe drop on the economy. You've seen some of it happen in housing, where there's been a very substantial slowdown of construction, uh, and a lot of people have been shut out of the housing market. That's probably going to get worse over the coming months. Uh, and, and so we're just going to have to see how that plays out. Yeah, certainly the doubling of mortgage rates has hit a lot of families across the country. Austin Gould's before us here tonight. Thank you so much for that insight. Still ahead tonight, college student slaying. The LSU senior shot multiple times while just sitting in her car. The search now for her killer. Plus, what's next for Adnan Syed, the hit podcast Serial, releasing its first episode in years after a major win in court. And neighborhood rocked what we now know about an explosion that destroyed a Chicago apartment building. Stay with us for more right after this.
Back now when we go to the South, where two college campuses are reeling from tragedies over the weekend. Families and students in Florida and Louisiana right now mourning the deaths of two college students killed in separate shooting incidents just days after starting their new semesters. NBC's Maura Barrett has the details. Tonight, two college campuses in shock after a student from the University of Tampa and one from Louisiana State University were killed in separate shooting incidents. That's terrible. Like, how can that just happen to somebody? And, like, this is supposed to be, like, a safe school. Like, it's just, like, scary. 19-year-old student Carson Senfield was shot and killed while celebrating his birthday with friends early Saturday morning at the University of Tampa. According to law enforcement, Senfield got out of an Uber and tried to force his way into another vehicle parked near Nearby. It is unknown why he tried to enter the second car. The driver shot Senfield in the chest, saying he feared for his life. He mistook a car and it cost him his life. Seinfeld's father speaking by phone with our affiliate. We don't have our son. We're mourning. We're heartbroken. We're devastated. He enjoyed his people, whether his people were in western New York or his people in Tampa or if, if he was anywhere else. He was such a generator of great vibes. Police say the shooter remained at the scene and is cooperating with detectives, but he has not been charged. In Louisiana, Baton Rouge police are still looking for a suspect, investigating the fatal shooting of college senior Allison Rice. Police say the 21-year-old LSU student was shot multiple times while sitting in her car at a railroad crossing early Friday morning. According to law enforcement, a suspect approached Rice's vehicle at around 2 a.m., shooting her as she sat in her driver's seat. This occurred less than three miles away from LSU's campus, where she was in her senior year. And now we don't have much information this particular time. We'll reach out to the, the train company to see if they had a train stopped on the track. Police now investigating the shooting as a homicide and say the motive is still unknown. Mayor Sharon Weston Broom releasing a statement on Twitter. This senseless violence is completely unacceptable, and Baton Rouge police officers are thoroughly investigating to bring the perpetrator to justice. She had such a bright future. She had an internship set up. She was so excited the last time she was here. Close family friend Luke Fosterman employed Rice at his restaurant. We want to find the person that did this. We love you, Allie. And Maura Barrett joining us now from Los Angeles. Maura, while these two shootings are not connected, it is a crushing way, obviously, to start this new semester. But homicides in these two cities is actually, they've been on the decline. Yes, yeah, and these incidents are an absolutely heartbreaking warning for students, some who are just stepping foot on campus for the first time ever, especially as gun violence has been tracking downwards year over year in both of these campus communities. So far this year, there have been 81 homicides in Bad Rouge and just 34 in Tampa. Now, both universities are offering counseling support for students following the incidents. Sam? Yeah, shockwaves on those campuses, no doubt. Maura, thank you so much. Now to an update on a story that we've been following for a few days. Adnan Syed, back at home after 23 years behind bars. A Baltimore judge vacating his murder conviction this week, and he now waits to see if he'll have to face another trial. Plus, a new serial episode dropping with reaction. Here's NBC's Cal Perry with the details. Tonight, Adnan Syed of Serial Podcast Notoriety, back at home after 23 years in prison, eating leftovers out of the fridge. At this time, we will remove the shackles from Mr. Syed, please. 41-year-old Syed was convicted of murder in 2000 as a teen. The case gained national attention when the hit podcast came out in 2014. Today is both joyful and incredibly overwhelming, and he and his family are processing all of this. Syed's release coming just five days after prosecutors in Baltimore motioned to vacate his conviction. They discovered their team did not disclose the existence of two other suspects to the defense in the 1999 murder of Heyman Lee, Syed's girlfriend and high school classmate. A judge agreed and the conviction was vacated. The case was extensively followed by the award-winning podcast back in 2014. Millions of listeners became obsessed with the case. But attempts for a second trial proved unsuccessful in 2019. The saga not over yet. Steve Kelly, a lawyer for Lee's family, releasing a statement saying the Lee family is disappointed in how quickly Adnan's hearing happened and that they were denied reasonable notice. They want the truth to come out. If the truth is that someone else killed their sister, daughter, they want to know that more than anybody. 
they were shut out of the legal process by the court and the state's attorney's office, and there was, it was inexcusable. It was a violation of Maryland law, and our, my clients are exploring their options with regard to appeal. Lee's brother, young Lee, speaking remotely on behalf of his family in court yesterday before Syed's release. I've been living with this for like 20 plus years. It's killing me and it's killing my mother. The judge giving prosecutors the option to drop the case or request a new trial within 30 days. We're not yet declaring Adnan Syed is innocent, but we are declaring that in the interest of fairness and justice, he is entitled to a new trial. Now at home and under house arrest with GPS monitoring, Syed waits for a potential new trial. And Cal Perry joining us now from Washington, D.C. Cal, a pretty dramatic turn of events here. So what was some of the new evidence that led to Syed's release? Yes, yeah, Sam. So while prosecutors uh, declined to sort of put forward those two new suspects back in the year 2000, the defense putting forward, as you said, some new evidence, including the fact that the victim's car was parked outside a suspect's family member's house in the days that followed the killing and new suspicion about some of the cell phone data, not as pinpoint uh, accurate as initially thought, Sam. All right, information that could be relevant. Cal Perry, thank you so much. When we come back, cold case closed. The so-called package killer identified and charged with the murders of four women in the 90s. What was it that helped investigators finally crack the case? Back now with Top Stories news feed and the alleged serial killer identified after more than three decades. Authorities said that 73-year-old Gary Muehlberg confessed to the grisly murders of five women in St. Louis from 1990 to 1991 after DNA evidence linked him to three of the cases. He is already serving a life sentence for an unrelated crime. And at least eight people injured today after a building exploded in Chicago. Officials say the blast caused part of that four-story apartment building to just collapse, as you see on your screen right there. That building and the neighboring one evacuated. The cause of the explosion is still under investigation. And the FBI is now investigating a weekend hack of hit game Grand Theft Auto. Get this, a hacker posting 90 clips of unreleased footage from the game's sixth installment online. That person was also trying to sell the game's source code. Rockstar Games says it does not expect any disruption to its live gaming services. Well, next tonight, they're calling it the biggest theft of COVID relief money ever. The Justice Department in Minneapolis today charging dozens with scamming $250 million from a program meant to feed children. Ken Delanian has more on tonight's Fleecing of America report. Prosecutors called it a staggering fraud, the theft of nearly a quarter of a billion tax dollars intended to feed hungry children, instead being used to buy cars, houses, and jewelry. The scheme that began with a simple idea in March of 2020 grew to become the largest pandemic fraud in the United States. 47 people now face charges, including conspiracy, wire fraud, money laundering, and bribery. The government alleging defendants connected to nonprofits and restaurants collected taxpayer money through federal nutrition programs. Their goal was to make as much money for themselves as they could. At the center of the indictments and appearing in court today, Amy Bach, founder of the nonprofit Feeding Our Future. Prosecutors say she was overseeing a massive fraud scheme. They say her organization recruited others to set up federally funded meal sites during COVID while oversight rules were relaxed. Soon, hundreds of sites in Minnesota were reporting giving out thousands of meals a day, but prosecutors say it was a fraud. More than 125 million fake meals are at issue in this case. Bach, whose organization the DOJ says received more than $18 million in administrative fees, pleaded not guilty today. Kevin Chambers leads the Justice Department's COVID fraud enforcement efforts. Does it make you mad? It, it infuriates me. This and says this case stands out because the money was meant for children. Where the money went instead were to uh, purchases of hyper-luxury uh, hyper vehicles, sports cars, real estate in Turkey and in Kenya, which I don't have to tell you has nothing to do with getting food, kids fed here in Minnesota. One big question tonight, Sam, is how this alleged fraud was allowed to go on for nearly two years. Justice Department officials said that when state officials first started questioning so many meals claimed by this organization, Feeding Our Future sued, and a judge required the state to continue sending them federal dollars. So far, the federal government has clawed back $50 million. Prosecutors say their investigation is continuing, and there may be more charges to come. Sam? Kendallanian, thank you.
And turning now to money talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. New data from the U.S. Census Bureau today shows that August housing starts, which measures new home construction, up 12.2 percent from July. But the majority of that construction was for multifamily housing. Now, this while building permits dropped 10 percent in August to the lowest rate since June 2020. CNBC real estate correspondent Diana Olick joining us now with some more information on this. Diana, first, let's talk about this home building data, significantly up from July, but as we outlined, the majority of that multifamily properties. What does that actually tell you about the overall state of the market? Well, you're right. That was mostly multifamily apartment buildings. And we, of course, need that because rents, as we all know, are sky high. But we did see a month to month bump up of three and a half percent for single family houses. And that was really welcome news. But I think the reason that that happened was because of mortgage rates. They went over six percent in June, then started to come back in July. And by August, the first week, they were edging toward five percent. We actually talked to home builders who said anecdotally they were seeing more buyers come in the door, more demand, more contracts which meant they put more holes in the ground. But as you said, going forward, knowing that rates would be higher again, those permits, which are an indicator of future construction, those were down. All right. The trend for mortgage rates heading in the wrong direction for home buyers. And so data from CoreLogic also reports that rents for single family homes were up 12.6 percent in July year over year. For many cities, we know it's higher than that. Is there any relief on the horizon for renters right now? Well, actually, I know 12.5 percent sounds like a lot, and it is, but it's down from where it was. In fact, this is the third straight month of those gains shrinking. So we were seeing over 13, 14 percent gains just back in March in single family rent. So when we see those gains start to shrink, it means the market's cooling. We know that's happening because of inflation. Renters simply cannot pay that much for rent. There's less demand. The landlords no longer have the kind of pricing power that they used to. Now, are rents coming down yet? We haven't seen that. But we have seen in both single family homes and in multifamily apartments that the rent gains are really coming back to normal levels, Sam. Well, that at least is encouraging. And you know, Diana, there's one school of thought here that inventory is going to remain tight so that home buyers should just try to buy a house now, even if the rates are going to eventually fall a lot further as they're rising right now. But if someone's been waiting out the housing market and they're facing those very high mortgage rates, what factors should they be taking into consideration? Well, so this is a really tricky one on inventory because you're right, we are seeing still very low inventory on the existing home side, but we're seeing twice as much inventory in new construction than we were, you know, barely six months ago. So if you're a buyer out there, you're wondering, should I get in, right? Even though rates are much higher. The problem is you're not going to find a lot on there that's fresh because sellers, look, they've got a lot of things going against them. If they're moving to another house that they're going to buy, do they want to trade a 3% mortgage rate that they probably have for an open? over 6% mortgage rate that they're going to get now and pay twice as much on their debt. Also, they may be concerned that since the market is so much less competitive, they're going to have a harder time selling their house. They're going to have to bring the price back. So we're seeing far fewer sellers out there. For the buyers, though, much less competition. You're not going to see the bidding war on the front porch like we saw, you know, really just last spring. And there's much more negotiating going. In fact, real estate agents are saying they're finally seeing deals with contingencies like, oh, my gosh, you can actually ask ask for a home inspection now. So that's a plus. But again, it is still a very pricey market. If you want to jump in, jump in. But don't feel like every house is the one you have to have and certainly don't overbid for it. All right. Patience is the key. Diana Olick, thank you so much. We move now to an NBC News investigation into illegal gold mining that's creating an environmental crisis in the Amazon. The effects there felt far beyond the edges of the rainforest. Produced in partnership with the Pulitzer Center's Rainforest Project, Cynthia McFadden takes us inside Peru. Tonight, the Amazon, critical to a healthy planet, is in peril. We travel to the emergency zone in Peru. What happens in the Amazon doesn't just stay in the Amazon. Professor Miles Silman has studied the Amazon for all of his professional life. He says the biodiversity here in Peru affects weather patterns, crop growth, and even carbon levels, which is why gold mining here is having enormous worldwide consequences. How bad is it? It's pretty bad. It's much worse than we had feared. Luis Fernandez is one of the world's leading experts on mercury. 
He explains that here in the Amazon, pure 24-karat gold is extracted by using barrels of mercury, which separates the gold from the sludge. Mercury is poison, isn't it? It is. It is. It's poisonous to humans, to wildlife. It actually persists. It doesn't break down. Uh, it lasts for centuries. Six years ago, the two Wake Forest professors created a not-for-profit, Cynthia, dedicated to better understanding and then helping heal this place, which has gone from a vital resource in absorbing the world's carbon to one that pumps ever more carbon into the atmosphere. The first meter of soil in the forest holds as much carbon as all the trees that are above it. And then when we think about the next meter, two meters, three meters, four meters, there can be a whole other forest's worth of carbon down that deep. Are you suggesting that if we dig down there, we may be releasing all of this old carbon into the atmosphere? No suggesting we really are. It's carbon leaving the earth and entering the atmosphere that is the primary greenhouse gas contributing to climate change. The ecological effect has been devastating. More than 370,000 acres of protected forest have been turned into this by mining. Desert, dotted by pools contaminated by mercury. In the region, millions of acres have been lost. And here's the catch. Gold mining with mercury is legal in Peru, but not on protected lands. And it is this illicit mining that pumps more than $3 billion worth of unaccounted for gold out of Peru every year, much of it headed to the U.S. What's fueling this gold rush? Money. The price of gold in 2007 was about $700 an ounce. Today, it's worth more than twice that much. Little wonder various transnational cartels and paramilitary groups have gotten involved, some now making more money trafficking illegal gold than drugs. The situation is seen as so dangerous that the U.S. military has stepped in, providing intelligence to the Peruvian government. This is just the beginning of a massive destruction. Así es, así es. NBC News is the first U.S. television network Peruvian special forces has permitted to embed with them since the pandemic. They're in charge of this area. It's called La Pampa. Victoria! This is not just an environmental disaster. It's also a real question of national and international security. Así es, así es. The Peruvian government declared a state of emergency here, which is still in effect, and launched Operation Mercury three years ago. They successfully pushed 25,000 miners out of La Pampa. Despite it all, uh, Silman and Fernandez land, are hopeful. They've mine. made strides in their reforestation work, figuring out what can be replanted, like the largest such enterprise in the Americas. That's a beauty. This is called Caliandra. It's a legume, and it's a, it's a survivor. This was all desert a few years ago, but with their help and a little push from Mother Nature, it's coming back. Nature always heals itself. It just uh, depends on how long it takes. Well, if we don't mess it up too much. Yeah. The problem with talking to a biologist is I'm thinking nature heals itself on the scales of, like, asteroids killing dinosaurs and okay. things like that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Realizing that the Amazon doesn't have that kind of time, the battle to save it continues as the destruction rages on. Regarding those criminal groups, a senior U.S. military official told us they have more people, hold more territory, and have a budget about five times the collective militaries of the governments in the region. So Sam? they're very well funded, Cynthia. You mentioned the financial incentives for them to operate yes. there as well. From your reporting, do you get a sense of just how powerful are these groups? They're enormously powerful, and, and consider this. Many of them are now making more money from illicit gold than they are from drugs. So powerful that they are buying jets, putting illicit cargo on the jets, whether it be guns and gold, and then when they get to the destination, they blow the planes up. They don't want to be tracked. That's rich. And that's a footprint as well. So let me ask you this, in terms of just the sheer amount of mercury that's been used here, how is that affecting the communities and the people that live there? Yeah, it's terrible because, of course, the mercury gets in the water. The fish are in the water, the fish get sick, the catfish there in particular, which is a popular food, the people get uh, ill as well. And you know, mercury poisoning, you can't do anything about it. Once you have the mercury in your system, it stays. It's especially dangerous for children. And, and a stunning uh, new study that we were with the scientists who did it, 
it's not just in the particular reason, 180 miles north of the mining zone, an indigenous community there, over 90% of the people have toxic levels of mercury, too, too high according to the CDC and others. It's, it's very scary. Scary and eye-opening. Cynthia McFadden, thank you so much. Coming up next, the hostage situation overseas. A man strapped with what appears to be explosives, threatening a dozen people inside of a bank. How this terrifying situation ultimately came to an end. And we're back with Top Stories Global Watch. We begin right now with that hostage situation at a bank in the country of Georgia. New video showing the suspect inside of the bank with what appears to be an explosive strapped to his body. You see it right there. Police say he demanded $2 million and a helicopter. The suspect was eventually taken into custody without incident. Deadly protests in Iran following the death of a young woman in police custody. This 22-year-old woman died after she was arrested for allegedly violating Iran's hijab law. Demonstrations erupting for several days after that, with some women burning their hijabs in response. A human rights group says that police killed at least five protesters so far. And Uganda has declared an Ebola outbreak. The World Health Organization says a rare strain of the virus was detected after the death of a 24-year-old man. Health officials right now investigating at least six other suspicious deaths in that area. Something to keep an eye on. When we come back, the college football player who is nearly 50 years old, why he is suiting up against guys three decades his junior and the lessons that he is teaching his younger teammates on and off the field. And finally tonight, he may be college football's oldest player, but he's only a freshman at nearly 50 years old or young, depending upon how you want to look at it, one defensive lineman is proving that age is just a number and sharing some important lessons along the way. At North Dakota College of Science this season, Let's go, Let's go. one freshman football player stands out from the rest because he looks more like a parent, less like a teammate. They've all been very receptive of me coming in and playing because at first they were like, they thought I was another football coach <laughs> on her first day of camp. Uh, then. And that's whenever I got in line to get pads. That's where like, I'm like, wait a minute, you're playing? That's defensive tackle Ray Rochelle. At 49 years old, he's a month older than the team's head coach. He's always in a good mood. He's always just kind of Ray, you know. He's always uh, in a good mood, ready, ready to work and, and uh, do what he can for his teammates. How about that for an action shot? <laughs> Rochelle is an Army veteran who still serves with the North Dakota Army National Guard. It's those 17 years of service that kept Ray in shape and gave him the mindset that he could get back to football. So I've been surrounded by young people throughout my military career. And so on and off the field, these guys are really, truly tremendous. Uh, I try to instill like that's what I'm talking about. Being punctual, being awake, to just do my hardest, working to strive to do my best every day of practice and also during the games. Suiting up to play in number 94, a nod to his age, as it's 49 backwards. Ray has become a leader on and off the field, making plays and just showing what's possible for any student athlete. I guess he's a very good symbol, too, for the younger guys that, uh, you know, never to give up hope. And, and there's always an opportunity if you're willing to go as far as Ray has. Although Ray is attending college for the first time, he has a lot to teach everyone not just about making place, but about tackling life. If I had the chance and I didn't take it, I would regret it. Um, I had the chance, and I'm taking it, and I'm living life to the fullest. And I'm having a blast out here with everybody all out here playing with these young kids and actually being able to keep up. Surprising myself a lot, so. They probably have a hard time keeping up with him as well. They say that football is a grown man sport. Not sure anyone thought it was that literal. We would like to thank our Fargo affiliate, KVLY, for their help with that story. And thank you so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Sam Brock in New York. Stay right there. We have more news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.